Hello and welcome to La Mesa, a City of San Antonio series where San Antonians dis- discuss timely topics in a roundtable setting. My name is Brian Chasnoff. I'm an assistant director of communications here at the city. I'm excited to be here to talk about mobility, how we move through the city now and how we will move through the city in the future. We all move in different ways, on foot, in cars, on bicycles, on buses, in wheelchairs. Many of us travel in some combination of these modes depending on the day or even the hour. We're old, we're young, we're living with disabilities. So how do we make our streets safe and accessible for all users? What are the benefits of more thoughtful roadway design? Can it save lives? fight disease, help the environment, spur the economy? Here to help me answer these questions and more is my esteemed panel of guests, all of whom are shaping how we move through the city. Thank you for being here to chat about the future of mobility in San Antonio. We have Art Herrera, Special Projects Manager at Via Metropolitan Transit. Thanks, Art, for coming. We've got Harley Hubbard, Assistant to the Director at the City of San Antonio Transportation Department. Thanks, Harley. We've got Timothy Hayes, a senior engineer at the City of San Antonio Public Works Department. And we've got Joey Pavlik, executive director at Activate SA. So thanks for joining me today, everyone. And I'm just going to dive right in uh, to the first topic, which is complete streets. Now, the city is actually updating its complete streets policy. So before we, we talk about the reasons for updating it, let's just define what complete streets actually are. What does that mean? And um, I'll, I'll just start off by going around the table and, and maybe y'all can share with us your, your thoughts on, on what that means to you. Sure. I can go ahead and get us started. Mm-hmm. So a complete street isn't actually an end product. It's a design process that we go through when we're looking at a total street design to make sure that we're considering all modes of transportation mm-hmm. with a focus on our most vulnerable road users. Right. And our most vulnerable road users are pedestrians, and everyone's a pedestrian at one point or another, right. cyclists, and people um, navigating with disabilities. Okay. Research has shown time and time again that when we design roads with our most vulnerable road users in mind first, we improve the safety of everyone on that road, including motorists. So it's really just a design process that we go through that considers all modes of transportation. Um, and the outcome of that process can lead to streets looking totally differently. Not every complete mm-hmm. street looks exactly the same, mm-hmm. but it just ensures that all needs have been considered. So so you're not trying to shove all modes of transportation into every street? Right? No, that's not appropriate most of the time. Right. You know, we don't need a via bus, a bike route, um, a super wide sidewalk, and four lanes of vehicle traffic on every street. It's making those conscious decisions, looking where people are making connections to see what modes fit best on each street. Right. And my understanding is you also want to prioritize the most vulnerable users, and we can get into that a little bit more. But Art, um, I'll let you. Sure. I uh, completely agree with everything that yeah. Harley just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the the concept of one size fits all is not necessarily appropriate with complete streets, and I think we just talked about that. Uh, one of the things that we t- often hear, at least from the transit side, is when you hear complete streets, that means buses everywhere. <laughs> and as Harley mentioned, absolutely not appropriate in all instances. Uh, most of the time, if, as long as we build a great pedestrian environment, right. you know, the, the, the locations of transit routes will naturally follow. Okay, great. Tim? Uh, I will, I'll uh, just sort of double down on what Harley said. The process is thinking about sort of in a context-sensitive way. <laughs> what are the things that happen along and, you know, within a street? Um, you know, the, the complete street uh, doesn't just serve the re- users who are going along it, but they're in the interactions that take place as well. Mm-hmm. It's your it's your trash pickup. It's you know it's so many things that that are small things, everyday things that take place on a street, um, and and uh, those are the those are the sort of granular details that we get into in design when we when we start you know actually looking at you know designing a street and all the things that we've got to take into consideration. This is definitely not a one size all fits mm-hmm. all process because not all streets are the same size. And not all streets have the same activities that take place on them. But there are specific design elements that correspond with complete streets, narrower lanes, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You can um, you can in- influence how somebody interacts with the street by, by shaping the built environment. 100%. Great. Joe? Yeah, so building off all those comments, you know, again, really important to focus on, like, cost and context instead of solutions aspects. You know, the... Mm-hmm. Building for all users. That's, you know, really big focus is like building for all users, but especially our most vulnerable road users. And that includes, again, you know, people of all ages, all abilities, and all roadway users in general. And so, again, so like 
all ages and abilities, make sure we're accommodating for, especially, your, you know, you know, if we build for, you know, make it safe and comfortable for children and elderly adults, we're gonna make it safe for everybody. Yeah. And same with for, you know, if we're building a street that's comfortable or safe enough and feels comfortable enough to cross for somebody in a wheelchair or somebody walking with a walker, mm -hmm. we're gonna make it not just safe on paper, but we're gonna make it comfortable for everybody too. So that's a big, you know, aspect in designing those streets at context instead of solutions and mm -hmm. Being in San Antonio, you know, it gets very hot in the summer. Mm -hmm. Are we including more, you know, street trees on our streets? Mm -hmm. uh, what about, what, what do we do with our stormwater? Yeah. So yeah. how are we, um, San Antonio is known as a flash flood city. Yeah. And so how are we designing our streets better to yeah. handle that stormwater? And so those are also very, you know, good uh, elements to consider on our streets as well. Right. It sounds like you're covering not only quality of life issues, but also safety issues. And that leads into my next question. Why are complete streets necessary or needed what are the benefits and I'll, I'll open it up to the the table um if anyone wants to take a crack at that the 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 thing that when we go out and talk to the community about complete streets or just the need for a better built environment the thing that we often remind folks about is the fact that regardless of the mode of travel mm -hmm. you're always going to start and end as a pedestrian mm -hmm. and so i think one of the most important things that we can include in all of our designs moving forward is a better built environment for pedestrian mobility. And that includes individuals in mobility devices and those that have ambulatory needs. Um, so when we're looking at uh, projects up and down, for example, San Pedro, mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at, at identifying uh, locations where we can improve the built environment for pedestrians, mm -hmm. maybe add landscaping features to make it a better environment and, and easier for them and more comfortable for them to walk along. Yeah, we're going to get into the green list. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, speed is, is an issue, right? Because I, I think the fatality rate uh, increases dramatically as cars move faster. I think it's 5% if they're going 20 miles per hour and it's something like 80, 85% fatality rate at 40 miles per hour uh, for pedestrians. So, um, you know, reducing pedestrian injuries and deaths uh, is obviously a big part of complete streets, right? And that, that feeds into to vision zero and... Um, Harley, do you want to do you want to talk about Vision Zero? Sure. So Vision Zero is an initiative. It's an international initiative that the city adopted um, with a goal of completely eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. Um, and people often say zero. That's a little ambitious. That's never going to you know be achievable. The question that we ask in response is, okay, then who's the one? Or who's the two? Yeah, well, there was just who is acceptable. There was a cyclist who was killed this week. Exactly yeah, outside of Mission San Juan. Exactly, yeah. and even even one is completely unacceptable. Absolutely. So it's an initiative that the city has adopted. That the transportation a, a department is really um, taking ownership of, of looking at our road design, looking at how we can improve safety for all of our road users. Um, yeah. San Antonio has one of the highest rates of crashes per one hundred thousand residents in the country. We're right below. Dallas, I think, has five fatal and serious injury classes per 100,000 residents a year. Mm -hmm. And Austin has 4.8, and we're right at 4.9. Um, so it is a really serious issue, issues like speed, um, distracted driving, um, and poor road design that encourages those behaviors can lead to more crashes. And, and pedestrian fatalities are on the rise across the United States. So it's, it's, a, it's a nationwide problem. Yeah. Um, uh, so... Back to what I said before about how the city is updating its complete streets policy. Can we let's talk for a moment about why that's necessary? And and I guess maybe start with well, I'll start with I'll go back to you, Harley. Um, why update it? I think the first, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the policy was introduced in 2011. 2011, okay. that is correct. And a lot has changed since then. First of all, best practices in design have changed greatly. The vehicles we drive have changed greatly. That study that you cited about, you know, the percentage of you being in or, uh, fatally injured in a crash, those are based on relatively small sedans, not the big trucks that you see driving around San Antonio. So actually here, those statistics are less in favor of the person that gets struck by a car. Um, so it's an old policy. Des uh, best practices in design have changed. We had a little bit of kind of passive language in the first policy. We were just getting our feet wet, learning about it with the rest of the world. The update will have more active language, but it'll also have right. goals and metrics set to show that we're being effective. So it's about implementation. Yeah. Maybe, Tim, you can talk about implementation because I know that there are uh, – I, I work closely with Public Works. I know that a lot of the projects that are in design are incorporating complete streets elements in them. So how do these complete streets elements get implemented? What's the, what is the process uh, – uh, a good process? Sure. So, so, so I think Harley hit at something that was uh, – 
that was really important, which is you know the the sort of soft language and tightening up the language when a when a project gets to with gets to project delivery, which is you know the department or the division that I work for. Um, we we need some some clear decision making um, tools in order to decide how and where these things can be can be put in place. Um, I think we can all be you know fairly realistic that you know people don't like when a street in front of their business or in front of their house changes, mm-hmm. right? And so you know we what we've got to have is the tools in place so that we can as uh, as design project managers as construction project managers communicate clearly what you know why why are these changes being being made to people's streets um, and where are they appropriate and where are they not mm-hmm. right um, and and so those are the kinds of things the kind of guidance language that you need and you need you need it to you need to have it sort of for- formalized. Um, so that when you know the teams who are rolling out these street changes, they have something to, strong to lean on mm-hmm. when we get pushback, when we need to educate, when we need to clearly communicate. This is in our policy; it's in our complete streets policy, and this is how we make decisions. Yeah. Um, for you know how our streets are going to look when we come through with a project, it mm-hmm. gives uh, it gives all of us the tools mm-hmm. to lean on in a situation. Like well, let's that. zero in on one project in particular that I sure. believe you're involved with. It's West College Link. Mm-hmm. It's part of the 2022. Bond program. Oh, I love this project. Part of the linear, linear green greenways. Green. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is. Uh, and I'll let you. I'll let you talk about it. But just to set the stage, it's it's on the west side, and it's uh, Memorial Street, right, mm-hmm. with Memorial High School and then St. Mary's University. And there is a stretch of of roadway that leads to Zarzamora Creek Greenway uh, that does not have a lot of connectivity, right? It's, it certainly doesn't. Yeah. Um, it, this is a great project, and it's one of the things that that was the promise of the Howard Peak Greenway Trail, the West Side Creek Trails, was you know taking those trails and connecting them to the larger community, right? Um, allowing neighborhood level connections and uh, and institutional level connections. And so, uh, what the Parks Department, in cooperation with the Public Works Department, is now doing is we're we're looking at. You know, large shared use paths that can connect into the trail system, mm-hmm. uh, make a connection between that linear greenway trail uh, mm-hmm. along the west side creeks, um, between St. Mary's and Memorial High School and the neighborhoods that surround there. Make this a space that is it's going to include, you know, plenty of street trees. It's going mm-hmm. to include, um, you know, a pedestrian lighting. So it's going to feel like a safe environment as well for people. There's a shared use path, right? And it's going to include a 12-foot wide shared use path. Yeah. That's right. Some place that is buffered from the vehicular traffic, uh, you know, at a, at a different grade. And so it's going to welcome people into the into the trail net. And can you define shared use path? Uh, sure, yeah. So a shared use path is, uh, is a... Um, it's going to be... It's going to look a whole lot like a sidewalk, but generally it's going to be wide enough so that somebody on... Uh, a bicycle or uh, a wheelchair and other pedestrians can share that space comfortably. And uh, that's the way that that should operate, very much like our Greenway Trails do now. So speaking of cycling and connectivity, the bike network plan, uh, this is another big exciting thing that's happening that's being updated, actually, because Mm -hmm. there was an original bike network plan. Also in 2011. Big year. Okay. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I guess uh, 2024 is a big year, too. Um, exactly. Tell us, tell us, I guess we can just go back. Why does this, why does this plan need updating? Yeah, so yeah. similar to the Complete Streets plan, design standards have changed. Back in the 2011 Bike Network plan, mm-hmm. it was totally acceptable to count a wide shoulder as mm-hmm. a cycling facility. And we've upped our standards since then. We don't like wide shoulders on Loop 1604 access roads being advertised to cyclists as ways that they should get around. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, San Antonio's population has just boomed. And with that boom is a demand for more connected cycling infrastructure Mm -hmm. and for safer cycling infrastructure. So the time was right with all of these changes to really look at where we are, look at the great facilities that we already have, and make sure that we're making those connections so that people, um, first of all, who bike recreationally have the chance to do so safely people who bike to commute have the chance to do so safely and people who don't have access to a vehicle Mm -hmm. have you know access to education Mm -hmm. healthcare, job opportunities just like everyone in a vehicle goes back to serving all users exactly also spurring the economy the local economy getting people to work yeah exactly we know that um, building bike lanes in front of business Mm -hmm. is actually great for business Mm -hmm. it brings in more shoppers it's great for the economy people can get around on bikes Mm -hmm. they have a great time the air is cleaner they're recreating it's great for your physical and mental health so really just making that great amenity 
And I mean, if nothing else, getting people to the greenway is easier so that they can right. enjoy that beautiful part of San Antonio. And are, you can put bikes on buses, right? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> All, the entire fleet allows for bikes either outside or inside the, inside the vehicle. Great. And that, and, right. So that's the combination again. I mean, it's not just one mode that we each use yeah. every day, although there is a very car-centric culture and, and a lot of folks mm-hmm. only use their car. But the, I think Complete Streets is really about mixing it up more, right? And not, yeah. Well, I like what Harley was saying about, you know, capitalizing on the great facilities that we already have, right? We have a, you know, since the 2012, 2011 plan, excuse me, rolled out there, you know, we've made some progress. We've made progress in getting a a a, a, a network of facilities uh, for bikes that have been installed through our bond programs, through our bike IMP program. Um, so there, there has been growth in this network and uh, looking at how do we connect those dots? Because you know, one of the, one of the things that's going to enhance safety is having those routes for people, having them known, predictable, signed in a way that's intelligible. Right? When somebody you know reaches the end of a of, of a bike facility or the end of a sidewalk, what are they going to do? Mm-hmm. They're gonna they're gonna they gotta continue their journey somehow, mm-hmm. and they're gonna continue it in a way that's probably less safe. Mm-hmm. Right? So if we have that network built, then I I feel like that you know the the decision making point for somebody. Uh, who may have made a less uh, safe decision now becomes a safer one. Yeah. Right? So that, that's a that's a huge part of this. We've learned so much since that 2011 yeah. plan about where we can do what. Um, that that I think you know it's a really great time to take a look at that and update our planned network. You know, I made two seconds stuff further as well. Uh, building into all those mm-hmm. points, I think again, like going back to the complete streets policy is, are we building this for system for all ages and abilities? Yeah. You know, speaking of the, you know the the network, we San Antonio has done a good job of building our network. But if you ask a lot of folks, even able bodied people, they feel comfortable riding their bike, you know, to get to work or to school. Um, oftentimes, you'll probably hear no, mm-hmm. um, especially again going to back to the all ages and abilities aspects. Mm-hmm. What do you feel comfortable with your child riding their bike to school or work? Yeah. What do you feel comfortable with your grandmother? And right. so that's the thing. That's the goal that we need to have Absolutely. with this policy to make sure that it is truly a network that anybody can feel comfortable again not just safe but right. comfortable to ride their bike and, and it's interesting we're, we're still in the outreach phase of the bike net the new bike network plan yeah, right different outreach phase so this uh bike network plan actually has three phases of outreach the first phase we did um in the heat of the summer last year <laughs> we were out at multiple community events we just kind of wanted to know what facilities were people already using and where were they noticing those connections so where was the facility ending and they were having to right. make that choice of am i going to have to continue in a less safe manner where are people already going? What facilities do we have that could be improved? Things like that. Right. Uh, phase two of outreach, which ended um, just in January of 2024, was asking what kind of facilities make you feel safe in certain situations. So we know that cyclists have different levels of you know, road stress that they will tolerate. Mm-hmm. We know there are um, recreational enthusiasts who will ride under any conditions. They will take the lane. They feel strongly. They feel safe about that. Um, but then we also know that there are kids who would like to ride their bikes to school. Mm-hmm. And I don't want them taking the lane. I want them to have a safe facility so all the kids can ride their bike to school. I would love to get stuck behind a bike bus, which is just like a whole peloton of cyclists on the way to school. That sounds great. Um, So we were asking questions, you know, what would help you make the choice to ride your bike? How far would you ride? Mm -hmm. Um, What kind of things keep you from riding right now? Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe sending your child, your grandmother out to ride? Um, if you use an adaptive bicycle for people with disabilities, is is the current network serving you and mm-hmm. how so? Mm-hmm. Um, we'll start phase three in April of this year. We'll be at events in the heat of the summer again. Um, we will be, it's not too hot in April yet. Not April, but we'll go through May. Um, we'll be out for bike month in May. Um, and then we'll be asking people about specific facility treatments on mm-hmm. specific roads. So we've kind of learned where we need facilities, what right. kind of facilities make you feel safe. So we're going to come out with a proposed matrix so that Joey and Activate SA can say, hey, I see that you have delineators proposed here Mm -hmm. um, and bring up kind of Tim's point. Did you know that we have like trash collection on this day and you're right in the middle of our trash collection? How is that going to work out? What do the people who actually know the roads know about that? And how can we kind of consolidate that so that it makes sense for our most vulnerable users and then also residents and businesses along that corridor? Well, I love the deliberate data-informed approach. Yes. That, that's just going to make the network stronger and and, and better. Absolutely. Um, and actually, even as this out- outreach is happening, there is a more robust bike network that's 
taking shape even now. Yeah. Uh, Tim, I think you're involved in the the cycle track project taking place downtown, which would provide an east-west link across downtown. Right? We've got several exciting projects coming downtown. Santa Rosa has a cycle track installed on either side mm-hmm. for you know its limits you know, through the 17, 2017 bond program. Mm-hmm. We're reconstructing Santa Rosa right now as part of the Zona Cultural. Um, that'll have a cycle track, which uh, for anybody who doesn't know what a cycle track is, it's uh, sort of a separated uh, bike track that is behind a curb, but also separate from the from the uh, sidewalk to make sure that, you know, you don't have, you know, pedestrians and bikes, um, you know, fighting for space. It's meant then. only for bicycles. It's meant only for bicycles, yeah. Um, and so in a, inter- intersecting that sort of through the, through the uh, heart of the west side of downtown will be uh, a two-way cycle track along Dolorosa Street and Market Street. Mm-hmm. That will go all the way from I-37 to the east to um, I-35 on the west. Side. Yeah, so I, I think this project actually harkens back to the 2011 bike network plan, right? Yeah, there yeah. were bike lanes called for on Commerce and uh, and and Market, or which becomes Dolorosa um, one-way bike lanes on a, on either street. Um, yeah. Those would have been street-level uh, bike lanes, and so mm-hmm. what we're what uh, what we learned with the Commerce projects that have taken place since then is. Commerce doesn't have a whole lot of right of way. It doesn't have a whole lot of room, right? Mm-hmm. So we ended up in one of those complete streets conundrums, right? What do we do when where we run out of space? Mm-hmm. Um, and the decision was made. Well, instead of putting you know a one way bike lane on one street, we have this great uh, one way couplet downtown. Mm-hmm. Couplet two one way streets, mm-hmm. there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we can actually put two way bike lanes on one of those where we actually have the room to do it. Okay. And so it's those sort of decision-making points yeah. that help us, you know, fill out that network. You know, and these are connecting flexible. to bike lane projects that already have taken shape through the 2017 bond. Like, and through the 2012 yeah. bond. We installed bike lanes on Frio Street as part of the 2012 bond, part of the Downtown Streets pro- Project. Mm-hmm. As part of the Market Street Realignment, we have a two-way cycle track on, mm-hmm. um, you know, along Tower of the Americas Way. Yeah. We have bike lanes coming at uh, key locations along South Alamo, which is currently under construction. Mm-hmm. Sorry for all the heartache on the construction side, everybody. <laughs> but uh, but there's a lot of facilities that this is going to connect to, not to mention the things that are north of the Alamo. And so we'll see what shapes up with this sort of Alamo connection. I don't know if we can maybe get bikes through there, too, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, well, Art, this is your moment now. Advanced rapid transit. We're going to do a, a hard transition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From bikes to buses. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Tell tell me all about about art. What is art? So, advanced rapid transit. Yeah. Uh, we've recently, relatively recently, uh, branded it Via Rapid. So, okay. Via Rapid. We have two lines under development. We have the the green line, which is the north south corridor. Uh, it is San Pedro. Mm-hmm. Through downtown from the airport, mm-hmm. uh, connecting the St. Barry's and Roosevelt corridors, mm-hmm. uh, just north of Mission Concepcion at uh, Steve's Avenue. Uh, and then the second line, which is uh, just beginning development, uh, what we call the Silver Line, is the East West Corridor, West Commerce through downtown, and then using the couplet, uh, the Dolorosa Market, and then the uh, Commerce Corridors through downtown, and then East Houston. Uh, just at uh, to the Frost Bank. I wanted to make sure I got the name right. Frost Frost Bank Center on the on the east side. So, back in 2020, voters went to uh, to the ballots and and approved a one eight cent sales tax mm-hmm. uh, to begin collection in 2026 uh, to make these projects feasible mm-hmm. to make it happen. Without that sales tax collection, these projects would not be happening. Um, and that sales tax is allowing us to construct these projects as well as operate these projects. Mm-hmm. Um, the federal contribution didn't hurt either. It, it absolutely did not. And I'm glad you brought that up. So we recently, in uh, December, at least for the Green Line, uh, received uh, uh, confirmation and approval from the FTA to enter what's called engineering. So it's essentially final design. And in that approval, they uh, they guaranteed a maximum contribution of 60% mm-hmm. for uh, just under $450 million project. So quick math, it's about $250 million Maximum federal contribution to the project, which absolutely mm-hmm. would would not make uh, would would makes this feasible yeah. to, to actually construct. Great, and let's talk about why art, how art is a more modern version of public transit. What makes it special? So there are two key things with ART that makes it uh, stand out with the rest of the services that we provide. One is absolutely the dedicated lanes. Mm-hmm. Dedicated lanes are going to make this uh, a much faster uh, and more reliable travel down the corridors. The, the other thing, though, uh, that a lot of folks aren't as keen on or aware of, rather, uh, is the off-board fare collection. Mm-hmm. So if you've ever been 
traveling down any corridor and you notice there's a bus stopped in front of you and you're realizing, hey, this bus is taking a while to, to move and pick up and drop off folks. There are a couple of things that are probably happening on that bus. Mm-hmm. One, uh, as is common, a lot of folks line up and wait till the very last moment to find their dollar ten or their dollar thirty rather mm-hmm. in their pocket. And that's absolutely going to take some time, right? Mm-hmm. The other thing is it's possible we're picking up an individual in a mobility device. Mm-hmm. And that means the bus has to kneel. There's a whole process by which we, we do this. The bus has to kneel, a ramp is deployed, and the operator has to get out of his or her seat and then go and, and physically secure the individual with these secure points mm-hmm. uh, on the bus. And sometimes that can take, depending on the, the, on the, the mobility device and the individual, two to three minutes. So if you're trying to, and that's just to secure, and then it's another two to three minutes to to, uh, to alight from the vehicle, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're operating a 10-minute headway, and it takes you six minutes sometimes to, to secure an individual and then get them off of the vehicle at their destination, you already have another bus four minutes behind you. Now it's hard to keep a schedule, mm-hmm. right? So what we're doing with ART is we're addressing some of those things I just talked about. One, dedicated lanes are going to get us through the corridor much more quickly. Transit signal priority is going to get us through the intersections more quickly. But then to, to address that alighting and, uh, uh, and a boarding time, we're going to have level boarding at the stations. So there's going to be the seamless transition for those that are in mobility devices or ambulatory to get into the vehicle, right? And then on the vehicle, we're going to have the self-securement uh, uh, system so that an individual in a mobility device can literally uh, back into a position an arm comes down and secures the, the individual without the operator having to leave, uh, leave their seat. Wow. And, and then with the off-board fare collection, what I was just talking about, folks looking for that dollar thirty in their pocket, they handle all the, the fare collection on the platform, mm-hmm. get on the bus. They can enter any of the doors. They can get out of the bus through any of those doors. What's the payment method? Uh, we're looking at it would be a, uh, a ticket vending machine or a fare uh, validation okay. system on the platform. So essentially, you would just handle your transaction either on your phone mm-hmm. or there at physically at the uh, at the kiosk on on the platform, and then the operator doesn't even have to worry about fare collection. Right. And uh, is Via making any commitments in terms of how frequent or reliable the the service is going to be? So uh, in terms of frequency, we're looking at ten to fifteen minutes all day, seven days a week. Mm-hmm. And when I say all day, it, it's really during those peaks. Uh, it starts around six a.m all the way through 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then slowly in the evening, we'll, we'll transition some of those uh, those buses off of the route. Okay. So let's talk about the construction because there's there's just for a few minutes. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. It's a, it's a hot it's, topic. It, yeah, uh, it's not everyone's favorite topic, <clears throat> but um, when it's going to go in phases, right? It, it will. So our construction schedule shows just over two years mm-hmm. uh, to construct this line. So the line is just under... 11 miles long. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we go out into the community and we talk about that, folks are are thinking, oh my gosh, you're going to be out in front of my business for two years. I mean, of course, I'm going to have some issues, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we recently awarded a uh, a construction manager at risk contract. And essentially, this contractor is responsible for just what I mentioned, construction management, but they're also going to be responsible for the construction. So this will be the Mm -hmm. construction contractor. So we bring them on board now during final design to work through those issues we can start phasing construction really early. We can go out and start meeting uh, those that live and work on the corridor. Any properties that may be impacted, we're sitting down with them and talking about construction methods. Mm-hmm. We're talking about impacts to their specific properties. And that way we can get feedback so that we know, okay, obviously, here's a great example. In front of a school, maybe we do construction during the summer. Mm-hmm. You know, In front of North Star Mall, yeah. maybe we stay away from the November to January time. Tim might have some tips for it. <laughs> <laughs> how to handle this. Tim, you got any tips? <laughs> School along the corridors. So like, I'm gl- delighted to hear it. <laughs> well, there, there's another topic that is uh, piquing a lot of folks' interest in San Antonio ar- around transit, around uh, the Green Line, uh, the, the concept of transit-oriented developments. What are they? Uh, what do they look like? My understanding is that there isn't one in San Antonio yet, as of now. Um, there, there is that I know of at least one development that has utilized the transit oriented development oh. overlay. Okay. Um, it's locate escapes me at the moment. That's but okay. I, we can, but, yeah. but there is at least one. There's at least one that's uh, that's under construction now. Okay. Okay. Yes. I can take a factor with the sure. for San Pedro. Sure. So it's a TOD transit-oriented development. Um, is an initiative led by the city with partners, obviously, at VIA, at the MPO, external stakeholders, and community members along the corridor. 
um, really to ensure that the community is getting the best out of its investment. We don't want this great resource to be an island that people can't get to. Right. So what does it look like for people to work, live, play, send their kids, bike, walk, get along the corridor so that the, uh, the rapid green line is accessible to mm-hmm. users along that corridor who mm-hmm. it was built for? Um, and just kind of encouraging development in that area mm-hmm. to coincide sure. well with, with the area. And some of the qualities of, of TODs, transit-oriented developments, they're dense, mm-hmm. right? They're walkable. There might be less parking at, at these developments. Uh, it just it just depends. We, yeah. you know, in an area with, you know, such a great transit facility, we would love people to use transit. Um, and sometimes it does lead to a little more dead sea. That could lead to apartment complexes. That could lead to office buildings that people could walk to from their apartments and maybe a small grocery store or bodega nearby that you could hop on uh, via rapid and get to the grocery store and right. hop on and go right back. Um, obviously, driving a motor vehicle will still be an option along the corridor. Via is only taking up a small area of the center lane. So people who have to or choose to drive or will still have that ability. It'll just once again, take the most vulnerable users in mind first. I think it's a tool to give you know development community some flexibility along the corridor. Absolutely, well, right? You know, we we know that San, the San Pedro corridor is you know sort of it's a, it's a historic corridor, right? So that means that you know configurations are aren't going to be the same as where when you got to sort of greenfield development somewhere you got plenty of space, right? And so what it does is it gives us tools for flexibility along a, a dense urban corridor. So that you can bring in some of that development that's compatible with this investment that we're made that we're making, and creates a lot of opportunities across the board to capitalize on it. And we're still very early in the process, mm-hmm. um, so I can't really speak to what will be in it. But something that's likely to be in TOD isn't necessarily the removal of parking, but the removal of the requirement to have a minimum amount of parking. Which so would be an incentive, right? which would be an incentive, and developers can make the best choice for their developments. Business owners can make the best choices for their business. Because we're not requiring a coffee shop to have 25 parking spaces along a corridor with great transit and great bike access and great pedestrian That's a good, access. That's a good distinction. That are all, you know, right behind it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right? One key thing you mentioned earlier, too, is just you know, the fact of community. Like, how is it also, like, there's a term being used these days of transit-oriented communities. Yes. And so how can that also be more of a driver for, again, like you said, even that connectivity beyond, you know, additional housing or office space. But also, uh, you said also, like, how can somebody walk or bike easily to get to the bus stop? Because mm-hmm. right now, sometimes again, like we talk about complete streets and bike networks, and how is how does that look? And what is the comfort level? Can somebody go and just you know, after getting off the bus, can they go sit on the bench and sit under some trees and enjoy the day? Yeah, and improve that quality of life in that area too. That's a good that's a good point to make, and that's why it's great having all of you here at this table because it's about everyone working together with all these modes, and because it's all part of the same big picture, right, for the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, and I'd like to add a plug. So I know we're we're focusing on uh, on the ART corridors on on via rapid corridors, but uh, but uh, when we go out and and because developers have come to us often to talk about, hey, you have a shelter out here, we'd like to incorporate this into our design. The other thing that we like to talk about though is we have a great frequent network mm-hmm. serving many routes and many corridors on on in the in the city. So we would encourage TOD anywhere along those frequent corridors, not just necessarily on right. San Pedro. And I think. The, the work that's undergoing now is going to help address that as well. This was a great conversation. I, th- I learned a lot, and I hope uh, our audience did as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.